Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to brotherlance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. Children are a gift and blessing from God. It says, Behold, children are a heritage of Yahweh. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Right? Because your spiritual covering over them stands. It doesn't matter if your kid is here or a million miles away. God is blessing and dealing with your kids in a special way because of who you are. God doesn't care about miles. It means nothing to him. Right? And so when God, when you're walking in the Lord, boom, that blessing is there. Rest assured, God is working on your children's behalf. Okay? Right? We're doing that for our kids today. We're providing them a grace and a mercy that you they can't find any other way other than having godly parents. Right. Because God makes a promise to us that, listen, I'm going to deal righteously with your children. I'll, I'll wink at things. I'll bless them. I'll, I'll give them many, many chances because you love me. Right. And so we're doing that for our children. Brotherlands.com. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for taking care of us through this week and on your wonderful uh, miracles and blessings, big and small. For helping to overcome the things that we struggle with during the week and that, you know, you don't give up on us. You keep encouraging us to go forward. And uh, so we just praise you that you're our firm foundation. You're our stable rock and that, you know, and life seems crazy and falling apart. You're you're not. So praise we praise you for that. And we thank you. Give us the Holy Spirit and what we're about to study. Help us understand parts and minds. And thank you for your love and many blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Boom. Yeah. I think there's an echo. May, if you guys want to mute while we're talking, unless you have something, there you go. Awesome. And Sarah's gone. Okay. <laughs> no echo now. <laughs> okay. All right. Today we're talking about children, the blessing of God. So first we did brotherly love. We did marriage. This one's going to be children. And I got another one planned for next week. So this is children, the blessing of God. Let's read. Children are a blessing from God. Yet, in this era of split, mixed, and broken homes, parents can feel helpless trying to positively affect the lives of their children. While it's easier to do this when the children are in your home, be of good courage. Yet, you still have the power to positively empower their lives. In this study, we'll cover key concepts and principles given to us by God that will give us the tools to allow our children to have the best opportunity for success in life and with God. All right? And so... It's weird because a lot of times you'll have a believing spouse or an unbelieving spouse, you know, or two believing spouses that have separated, you know, or divorced or living different houses. And then you have kids that have two different homes, you know, and so you worry about like the influences they're under while they're not in your presence. Right. If you're a good parent, you do, you know, or vice versa. And so what we were going to read about is basically a recap for marriage, which we kind of did last week. But we'll recap it with a little extra and then we're going to move on to the, uh, the way we can bless our children. So the reason for marriage, God gave them th his blessing and said, have lots of children, fill the earth with people and bring it under your control. Rule over the fish in the ocean, the birds in the sky and every animal on the earth. Genesis 1 Okay. Next one. Did he not make you one? Although uh, he had the residue of the spirit. Why one? He sought godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. Malachi 2.15. So we talked about that last week, that the point of having uh, marriage and relationships and intimacy is to create godly offspring, children for God. So more life, uh, light bearers for Christ that are filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And so if you have kids, that's the plan, okay? So don't be a stumbling block to your children. But Jesus says, allow the little children and don't forbid them to come to me for the kingdom of heaven belongs to one like these. Matthew 19, 14. This is a, a, a thing where you'll have people that have kids that are coming to Christ and the parents won't let them. Right, they're creating a stumbling block, right? And that goes with the next one uh, that we want to do. It says the danger of failing to raise up godly children. It says brother will deliver deliver up brother to death, and the father his child, and children will rise up against his parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Matthew ten twenty one through twenty two. So it's weird. You might be a Christian, but you're if you're failing to raise up godly children, you might be putting a noose around your own neck. Right. Because if they don't have the love of Christ and you never shared it with them and you never taught them in the ways of the Lord, you know, growing up as a child, 
you know, you might be undoing your own end there, you know. And so you don't want to be a stumbling block that prevents them. And you don't want to sit there and ignore the thing and be just like, oh, they'll come around when they want to. You know, no, that that's your job. That's You know, you're, you're there to present it. It has to be their relationship. But up until a certain age or age of reason around 12 or 13, you are responsible for all of it, you know. And you're supposed to encourage them and teach them up. Now, most parents that are God, God centered, Christ minded, you know, what happens with them, and I've seen this in church, is they do this to their kids their entire life about it, and they never let them grow in their faith in the home. And so that's why most kids that when they leave the church at 18, they don't come back. It's because it's, it was never their faith. They were never taught to make decisions and, and how to choose for themselves. And so, like, for with us and our kids, Ariana's at the age, she has to make the choice. I don't make her do devotions every day, I tell her the importance of it. She sees me do mine. Right. But she's at that point where she needs to start choosing herself. Right. And so when we were little, we'd be like, do your devotions and stuff like that. But now she's getting older. And so what, it's scary because you're like, well, you're giving them too much freezing back away. It's like, no, they're bathed in it in my house. You know, and so she loves Christ anyways. And she does them on her own without being told. Like she made herself her own prayer, prayer closet. Nobody told her to do that. She did it. Right. And that's what you want. You want to see that personal growth on their own, making decisions for themselves and making mistakes. Because where do you want them to make a mistake outside of the house? Right. Where you're not there to catch them and help them and correct them and direct them or let them make the mistake while they're in your house. Right. And so sometimes parents, especially once they get into teenage years, you have to be able to back up a little bit and let it be theirs. Right. You know, and so there's still guidelines. There's still rules. Don't get me wrong. But like if you're just constantly holding them down the entire time and not letting them experience God for themselves, then you're not providing the opportunity that they need to make it for them. OK. OK. So a burden broken to the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply your pain in childbirth and pain. You will bear children. Your desire will be your husband's and he will rule over you. Genesis three sixteen. Right. So there is a. a the fall, right? There was like this burden that was put on Eve that, listen, you'll now bear children in pain, right? But my wife read this book called uh, uh, Supernatural Childbirth, and she went by this book. And basically what it says is this, that curse was broken in Christ Jesus. You don't have to bear children in pain anymore, All right? So every time she had a child, the doctors and nurses just marveled at her because she didn't yell. She didn't scream. You know, yeah, you push when you're having a kid, but, you know, there was none of the you know, theatrics, oh, get away from me like you see in Hollywood movies. That always makes my wife mad when she sees that. And so it doesn't have to be that way now. Okay, it doesn't mean that it won't be tough. You're giving birth, but it doesn't mean that like there's this traumatic, you know, head spinning, vomiting, you know, like demonic looking lady like you see in Hollywood movies, you know. And so, but here's what it says. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. And with his stripes, we ourselves are healed. Isaiah 53, 5. Okay, next one. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is having been hung on a tree. So that the blessing of Abraham might be the, uh, to the nations in Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3, 13 through 14, right? And so a lot of people worry about childbirth and stuff. There's that book, Supernatural Childbearing or Childbirth by that book. You know, if you're worried about that, claim those promises. Realize that God is there to assist in your childbearing. Don't fear childbirth, you know. God will bless you in it, okay? And so let's go to the next one. Children are a gift and blessing from God. It says, Behold, children are a heritage of Yahweh. The fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, which is five. They won't be disappointed when they speak with their enemies in the, at the gates. Psalms 127, 3 through 5, at the top of page 2. And so, uh, top of page 2. Okay. So, children are a blessing from God. It's the point of marriage to raise up godly children. So, what you see is, you know, we learned last week that he who finds a wife finds a good thing in the favor of the Lord. That that marriage is there to bear godly children. That children are a blessing. So, what do we see? We see a blessing train, right? A lot of people nowadays act like their kids are curses and burdens and they can't wait for them to move out of their house and they're just so sick of it, you know. But here's what I've learned in my children. Whatever you failed to do in their younger years, you pay for it when they're teenagers, <laughs> you know. So any inadequacies, any lack of uh, due diligence in any area will manifest when they get 
to become teenagers, you know? And so, and then, then a lot of people don't know how to handle teenagers and they don't like teenagers, you know? But the thing is, is you see that growing from like the 10 age up to through puberty, mm-hmm. right? So you're getting a roadmap of what's going to come, you know? So if they're freaking out when they're 10, 11, and 12, just imagine until they're teenagers, right? They should send off warning signs. Get on top of that problem, fix that problem mm-hmm. quick because there's going to be a point of no return where that's their personality, you know, and good luck, you know? And so, uh, next one. A song of ascent. How blessed is every one of the Lord's loyal followers. Each one will keep his commands. You will eat what you work so hard to grow. You'll be blessed and secure. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine in your in, in the inner rooms of your house. Your children will be like olive branches. And they sit around your table. Yes, indeed. The man who fears the Lord will be blessed in this way. Psalms 128, 1 through 4. And, you know, and so what we have here is like God's like, listen, if you're pleased the way God wants to give you children. Right. And so nowadays, commodity for most people is houses, cars and stuff. Back in the day, it was children, you know, because the more children you had, they could protect you. They can help uh, secure the land and work and all this other stuff and bear the light of Christ. It's still that way. Society has flipped it. That your success is how many cars you have, how many ounces you have, how much junk you own, you know, but really it's children. Right. Okay. So having children later in life is a major blessing from God. The godly grow like palm trees. They grow like cedars in Lebanon planted in the Lord's house. They grow in the courts of our God. They bear fruit even when they are old. They are filled with vitality and have many leaves. So they proclaim that the Lord, my protector, is just and never unfair. Psalms 92, 12 through 15. Right. And so if a man pleases the way, you know, I feel like I part, partly have accomplished this because I had a kid in my 40s, you know. And so praise God for that. You know, now, but, you know, if you look in the scriptures, people got much older and had children, you know. And so, again, we see that children are a blessing. They're not a curse. They're not a burden. They're not a problem that needs to be fixed. They're they're an offering from God to bless our lives. Right. And if we if we're constantly feeling like. You know, I'm just sick of my child. I'm sick of this and stuff. Then we're not handling the blessing in the way it was intended by God, right? And so, and everybody has different personality types and how we deal with stuff. And that will affect your relationship with your kids too. And then your your childhood yourself and the way you were raised will affect your childhood, your children's childhood. So, that's something we have to look after. All right. If your ways please the Lord and it unleashes God's favor upon your children. It says, I want this concept to be understood before we go any further. Even if your children are not in your life, home, or sphere of influence, you still have the power to bless them in a mighty way. How you live your life and walk with God will either shut or open the door of blessing and favor on them. Okay. So the foundation, uh, foundational blessing upon you, right? And so this kind of works with if the kids are in your house, they're going to be blessed in this way. But uh, it says, because you have made Yahweh your refuge and the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall happen to you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Psalms 91, 9 through 10. All of Psalms 91 is great. Go and read that. You know, next one. The wicked are overthrown in a parish, but the righteous household will stand. Proverbs 12, 7, right? And that doesn't mean that you won't have problems because the Bible says a righteous man has many troubles, but the Lord delivers them from them all, right? But the promise is, is that it will never be so much that you get dissolved away, right? Your house will stand. You'll see the wicked around you perish and everything fall apart in their lives. God will make sure it doesn't happen to you, okay? Said when a man's way pleases the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Proverbs sixteen seven, right? And so we, as godly people, have you know a lot of enemies because we stand for Christ and stuff. But this uh, proverb tells us that listen, if you're doing that right, God God will hold it back, right? They might not like you. They're still your enemies, but they'll keep them at a distance for you, okay? And, of course, this will be a blessing to your children because they can live in peace. All right. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. Acts 16, 31, right? So if you want salvation to come to your house, you need to walk in salvation, right? And so this was uh, given to the jailer, you know, and uh, after it shook and, you know, Paul, I think, and Silas were there. But, the, you know, so the intent here is like, listen, you want salvation for your family? You receive salvation. And, that, and then that will bring salvation into your home, especially as the man or the leader of your house, right? You have that special blessing from God to do that. Okay, so here's the ones that we really want to focus on. So a lot of people have broken homes or split homes or something like this. These are those blessings that we can assure ourselves that, listen, if we live right before God, God will be blessing our children, even if they're not around Mm -hmm. us. Right. Because your spiritual covering over them stands. It doesn't matter if your kid is here or a million miles away. God is blessing and dealing with your kids in a special way because of who you are. 
God doesn't care about miles. It means nothing to him. Right? And so when God when you're walking in the Lord, boom, that blessing is there. Rest assured, God is working on your children's behalf. Okay? So it says, Regards, receive God's favor for dealing righteously with those in your house. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide for Abraham what I'm about to do? After all, Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all the nations on the earth. Many receive blessings through him. I have chosen him so that he may command his children and household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. Then the Lord will give to Abraham what he had promised. Genesis 18, 17 through 19. So he's walking away from Abraham. And he's like, hmm. Should we tell Abraham what we're going to do? And then he goes, well, Abraham's going to raise his children right and teach them the fear of the Lord. And he goes, yeah, we'll go ahead and tell him because of that. And then he turns around and tells him, right, what's going to happen. And so that's how we do. So how we deal with our children will affect how God is dealing with us, right? And so what we do with our children is a blessing back to us. If we're doing it godly, then we get that favor again. We get layers of favor, right? And so some people have big layers in one area and small in the other. You can maximize all the layers of favor. Who doesn't want favor? All right, bottom of page two says the covering of God over your children. Okay, these are what I was just talking about a second ago. These are the blessings of you rocking, walking right with uh, God, and it blesses your children because of it, right? Be encouraged. Here we go. It says the righteous person behaves in integrity. Blessed are his children after him. Proverbs 27, right? So if you walk in integrity, you're blessing your kids, period. That's it. Doesn't matter how far away they are. Okay, top of page three. Grandchildren are like a crown to the elderly, and the glory of the children is their parents. Proverbs seventeen six. I love that verse. So you are the glory of your you your child. You basically, you provide the glory or the honor to your children. Is what it's saying, right? The glory of the children is their parents, right? So by your righteousness, by your lifestyle, by your choices, you're bringing glory and honor upon your children's head. They might not know it. They might not appreciate it, but it's happening, right? What's the next one? Let your work appear to your servants, your glory to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Psalms 90, 16 through 17, right? So let your work appear to your servants, right? So this is a person who loves and serves God and your glory to your children. So your service to the Lord or to Jesus, to God, makes his glory appear to the children, Right. So you're breaking open an avenue for them to receive salvation, to walk with the Lord in your house, out of your house. Doesn't matter. Right. It's happening because of how you are. Right. Praise God. OK, next one it says, hallelujah. Blessed is the person who fears the Lord and, and is happy to obey his commands. Right. His descendants will grow strong on the earth. The family uh, uh, of a descent, a decent person will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. His righteousness continues forever. Psalms 112, 1, 2, 3. So what does it say? You obey God, you're obedient to him. His descendants will go strong on the earth. You want your children to be blessed on the earth and grow and be wealthy and to have the nice things in life? Your obedience to Christ is doing that. And you see that in a lot of families, you know, especially in ministry-minded families where like the, the parents pay all the costs, you know, for the ministry. And it's the children that get the big boom. Right. Uh, Billy Graham, you know, uh, hit the same way. Godly parents. Uh, 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 there, I, another one forgot. They were poor people, but they raised up their children. Right. And it was the children that got the blessing of all the sacrifice, all the effort that the parents put in. The children reaped the benefits. We see the same thing in David. Well, look what all that David went through. Then Solomon got all the blessings. So I'm confident what I'm doing now in my life is blessing my children beyond measure. Like I can't give them wealth and riches. I'm giving spiritual wealth and riches, mm -hmm. right? And so they don't even know that it's really happening, but they're going to walk in it one day, mm -hmm. right? And so that's what we do for our kids. Okay, next one. Mm -hmm. it says the children of your servants will go on living here. The, their descendants will be secure in your presence. Psalms 102, 28, right? So these are people that serve God. In other words, the land of Israel at the time, their descendants will be secure in your presence, right? So those who serve God, their children become secure in the Lord. Right. So you're if you want the best for your the best for your children, you have to be serving God. You have to be ministry minded. You have to be outwardly focused. You have to be doing something for Christ, obeying him. And that will bring the security you desire for your children in your house, out of your house. It doesn't matter. Your actions are affecting their well-being to this moment, to this day. Right. And so next one. 
You who fear Yahweh, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and their shield. Yahweh remembers us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He'll bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear Yahweh, both small and great. May Yahweh increase you more and more, you and your children. Psalms 115, mm -hmm. 11 through 14, right? So what is the blessing there? That God is going to bless you and your children. It just doesn't stop with you. Now, your children have a, a, a choice on how much they want to receive, but you're providing the, the avenue, right? You're breaking down spiritual boundaries and barriers that a lot of people in the world have to try to walk through to get to Christ and God, right? But these are being broken by you, by your obedience to Christ, by your willingness to love and obey him, right? Okay, so next one. But the Lord continually shows loyal love to his faithful followers and is faithful to their descendants, to those who keep his covenant, who are careful to obey his commands. Psalms 103, 17 through 18, right? So if, you, if, you, if you're loyal and love God, he's being loyal and faithful to your children because of it, right? Because look at in the Old Testament, how many times it's like because of Abraham, Isaac, and, you know, Jacob, and, you know, this, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Because I made a promise to them, your foreparents, that I was going to do this. You're acting like a bunch of fools, but because I promised, right? We're doing that for our kids today. We're providing them a grace and a mercy that you they can't find any other way other than having godly parents, right? Because God makes a promise to us that, listen, I'm going to deal righteously with your children. I'll, I'll wink at things. I'll bless them. I'll, I'll give them many, many chances because you love me, right? And so we're doing that for our children. Okay. Uh, which one? Uh, next one. Uh, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and streams on dry ground. I'll pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They'll spring up among the grass as well as by the water courses. Isaiah 44, 3 through 4. So it is saying there, listen, because of you loving me and having a relationship with me, I will pour my spirit, the Holy Spirit, upon your descendants. Boom. My blessing on your offspring. So he's going to bless your children, right? All because of your relationship with him, right? As that was Isaiah 44, 3 through 4. Next one. When, uh, what man is he who fears Yahweh? He will instruct him in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall, uh, soul shall dwell at ease. His offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of Yahweh is with those who fear him. He will show them his covenant. Psalms 25, 12 through 14, right? His offspring shall inherit the land, right? Though If you fear God, your children are going to inherit the land. You're doing something for your kid every single day or your children, in your house, out of your house, by how you walk with Christ, how you walk before the Lord, right? I mean, this is replete. There's so many scriptures that say this, that like, listen, how you do is affecting your children, or if you're not doing is affecting your children, right? And so we want to make sure we're doing what pleases God. What's the next one? It says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet not, I have not seen the for, a righteous forsaken nor his children begging for bread. Psalms 37, 25. The caveat there is the righteous. Right, if you're living righteously with Christ and God, and he said, nor is children begging for bread, that means he's going to provide for your children. You're going to provide, he's going to provide. Right, a righteous man will provide for his family, but the intent here is that God's going to provide. Right, when you can't provide and you've done all you can, it's God that's coming through. Okay, uh, Psalms 37:25. Uh, mm -hmm. Next one. But the Lord has promised to fight on our side and to rescue our children from those strong and violent enemies. Isaiah 49, 25. Right? So God has promised to his children that he's going to be fighting on our behalf and that he will rescue our children. If your children are in a position or a situation that's not pleasant, not pleasing, and not righteous, God will go in and rescue them. Claim that promise. Say, rescue my children. Amen. They're in a bad situation. They're in a bad household. You know, mixed homes, split homes, broken homes, you know, and they're got ungodly people trying to rule their lives. Claim that promise. Rescue my children. Amen. You know? It's Isaiah 49, 25. Okay, next one. This is what the Lord says. Prisoners will be freed from mighty men. Loot will be taken away from the tyrants. I will fight your enemies, and I will save your children. <laughs> right? Uh, now, same one above. Different reading. Okay? Next one, uh, all your children will be taught by the Lord and your children will have un unlimited peace. Isaiah 54, 13. Okay. And so worship God. So what's this mean? So your children are in your house, right? You love them. You pray for them. You're living righteously. You're trying to please Christ and God. Because of that, God is teaching your children the things you can't teach them because you're not there, right? He's blessing them. He's being with them. Right. He's looking after him and putting a shadow of covering over them to protect them. Right. And so 
be obedient. Love Christ. Go hard for the Lord. You want to bless your children? Live like you want to bless your children and do what God wants you to do. Be obedient, right? Next one. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. It'll be a refuge for his children. Proverbs 14, 26. So your fear of God, your holy respect before the Lord brings you strong confidence that like, listen, there's a confidence that you get from not being stuck in sin. I didn't know until I got rid of all the junk in my life. It doesn't mean I never sinned. I just didn't have any rebellious, perpetual sin I was struggling with. Mm -hmm. That Okay, we're done with that stuff. That brings such a confidence. Because what's the devil do? Because when you fail in it, then he goes, nin, 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 you failed, and he puts the doubt and stuff. And it's not even true doubt. Because God wants to grace you out and, and forgive you. But it just it puts that pressure on you. right? But you'll be like, uh, oh, I know I'm doing the right thing. You know, and so it's just like this. What you guys know, my well went bad and uh, went sour. Well, that night that it happened, I went back there and told Melissa, I was like, listen, you know, God called us to ministry. We're about to go to bed. I was like, God called us to ministry. You know, he said he's going to take care of us. I was like, I want you to sleep in peace. This is what I told her. I was like, you sleep in peace. I'm going to sleep in peace because you know what? This isn't our problem. It's God's problem. Mm -hmm. God has to take care of it. Yeah. I don't have to figure this out. I'm not going to go and lay in bed all night trying to figure it out. Now it's inconvenient for seven days, but, you know, it, the problem solved. Praise God. God brought the right people and everything, right? And so what does that mean? I have children in my house. I need to take care of them, right? My neighbor says, Lance, if you need water, you can come get as much water as you want. And, and she was going to offer to let me do my laundry at her house. So God's like, I got this. Just be patient. Wait for me. Wait upon the Lord. <laughs> right. But so when we have this strong confidence that like, listen, God, I can't fix this. It's too big. I don't know how big the problem is. I don't know. We have to drill, you know, what it is, but you're going to have to figure this out for me because I ain't got it. Right. So what does that mean? It says, cast your cares upon the Lord because you care. I was like, okay, here you go, Lord. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this. This is yours. You have it, you know? And, uh, and, and so we did, you know, and he's faithful and he came through so much that we have now designated today water day and we'll remember it every year from this point <laughs> forth, you know? And so, you're right. It's water day. So, um, you know, praise God, you know? And so, but you can get this strong confidence in you that listen i'm doing it right i'm it's not i'm not perfect you know god forgives me confess your sins when you sin you know but you you know that you're not just like in rebellion against god right. you know and that like god's got your back and he's gonna make it work you don't know you don't understand dude i am so like proud of my family and that is not pride i'm just like so pleased in the way we handled it the way we responded there was no negative remarks there was no woe is me there's no what are we gonna do now there's none of the hair on fire stuff you know everybody responded righteously and now looking back okay now looking back over the past week i'm like man i would feel like such a fool right now now that the problem's fixed and it wasn't that expensive and we got righteous people that came in and did honest work and didn't try to gouge me or make another problem for me i would feel like a fool looking back if i was like freaking out the whole last seven days Never trust yeah like oh you know, I was like, no, be still. Know that I'm God. Cast your cares. Wait upon me, you know, and just chill, relax, you know. And so I'm like, okay, God, here you go, you know. And I, I had such peace because as soon as I say it, it came out of the thing, I was like, well, that's your problem. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> like, I don't do about that, Lord. You can take it, you know. And the problem comes is when we try to take our problems and we try to wrestle them and we try to figure them and dissect them and get our viewpoints and all that stuff. No, just here you go, Lord. Please, I need your help. Take care of that for me, okay? Mm -hmm. And he wants to. And that's the thing. And I think that was the lesson he was teaching me, teaching my family, you know, is that like, listen, guys, you can count on me. You can trust me. Take a deep breath, you know. And if we look back on most of our problems in life, most of our fears never happen. We, we'll build up mountains, exactly. you know, but when, looking back, you know, we're like, well, none of that happened, you know, and so we need to be careful. And that's where the strong confidence in the Lord comes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> now, top of page four. Mixed marriages. What about the kids? Either married or separated, your faith, faith blesses your children. And to the rest I speak, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife unbelieving, and she is pleased to dwell with him, let him not send her away. And a woman who hath a husband unbelieving, and he is pleased with her, let uh, her not send him away. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified in the wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified in the husband. Otherwise, your children are unclean, but now they are holy. First Corinthians seven twelve through 14. This becomes a big fear in relationships, you know. Or if, like, you're in a broken home, and the, the, your spouse, your divorced spouse, you know, uh, isn't a believer, but you are, that blessing is still on your children because of you. 
their unbelief doesn't trump your belief. Mm -hmm. Your belief trumps their unbelief. God is more powerful than the devil in the dark side, right? And so your faith in Christ and Jesus is more powerful and it blesses your children regardless of how evil the other side becomes, mm -hmm. okay? And so ha be of good church. Okay, good conduct with your children. And I don't know if I said that. First Corinthians 7, 12 through 14. Sometimes I have to go back and edit over verses I forget to say. So I think in the future, I'm going to switch this up and put the verse first. But anyways, do not seek your own good, but the good of the other person. First Corinthians 10, 24. Obviously, when we, want to, when we have children, it's them first. We have to sacrifice for them. They depend upon us like we depend upon God. We have to put them first. Okay. In love of the brothers, be tenderly affectionate to one another and honoring, preferring one another. Romans 12, 10, another promise principle that... You Listen, prefer your children over yourself. There are there are uh, uh, parents out there. Like one time, I was donating time at a uh, uh, a mission that was feeding homeless people and poor people. So I, I'm carrying the plates out. Like I'm and there's a dad and and some kids. So I start laying down plates for the kids, and I was going to go back and get the data plate. I come over there. He took the plate from the kids. I know it floored me. I was like, how could you do that to your own children? Obviously all these people were very hungry people and they were down and out, you know? And so that's not what God wants, you know? And so if we get opportunities to choose between us and providing for our children, choose your children. God will bless you in that. Okay. Next one. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. First Thessalonians 5.15. All right. And so in family, especially when you get teenagers, it's easy to go tit for tat, just like in your marriage, go tit for tat. Well, you did this, or I'm doing that, or you didn't do this, or I won't do that. And I'm going to harbor secret anger against you for the rest of the day. And, you know, all these games that parents play with each other and with their children. You know, well, I'm just mad at you, you know, and so I kind of grew up in that. And so I hate that. And so like my uh, I one and done, we're going to we're going to talk, we're going to discipline and it's over. It's not going to be this funk hanging over our house all day long. Right. And so you don't want that. It's not good. It doesn't help anybody. So by this, we know love that he laid down his life for us, that we have to lay down our lives for our, for the brothers. First John three sixteen. again, in the body of Christ with your wife or spouse and, and with your children. Okay, same thing. Be angry without sinning. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil any opportunity to work. Ephesians 4, yeah. uh, 26 through 27. Now, it doesn't say don't be angry. It just says don't let your anger cause you to sin. Right? God gave us our emotions, and sometimes it's the right to be angry. But it's hard as parents to know when we're crossing that line of, okay, we're getting into sin. Or we're getting so angry, we're saying stuff, doing stuff, we're acting in a way that is not pleasing in Christ's sight. It's struggle for all dudes. I know that. Just being honest. You know, and, it's, and, and you know, moms too, I've seen that. And so, uh, you know, and so we have to be very careful on how we discipline, how we interact, you know. And don't send, like, you know, family, like, you're going to bed without your dinner, and, and you're going to lay there all night. And and stew in it and then wake up the next morning you know no don't don't put your kids to bed with this burden on them that's just evil you know you're cursing your children by doing that right you need to figure it out before they go to sleep set them right and one thing we do in our house is we try to restore quickly so after discipline we give hugs and kisses and talk and you make sure they're okay and restore that relationship fast Right. Don't keep put, building this barrier between you and your children by super harsh discipline with no restoration. It doesn't work. OK, which goes into our next one. Don't provoke your kids. There you go. And the fathers provoke not your children, but nourish them in the instruction and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6, 4. And next one. Fathers, don't provoke your children so that they won't be discouraged. Colossians 3, 21. Right. And so we don't want to deal with our kids in such a harsh manner that like we're provoking them to anger. You know, and you have to know your children to know when that's happening because different things work for different children. Their personalities are different. And so if something in them gets triggered by something you do or say, even if it's not wrong, you need to be careful on how you handle that because you're just putting something in their hearts that's going to manifest in another way. So it's like a pressure balloon. And then, you know, the, all this pressure builds up in your side, inside your children and then the wrong thing pops it, you know, and then you think that's the problem. But really, their heart's been broken or they've been frustrated or, you know, you don't understand understand me. You don't listen to what I have to say. You ignore what I'm trying to explain myself, you know? And so what we teach in our house is like, listen, receive your discipline, receive your punishment. After that, we can talk anything you want to talk about. Mm -hmm. You want to explain? That's fine. You know, you want to give us a point of view? That's fine. You can do that. We want to know that, but not during discipline. 
right? Because then it becomes an argument and, you know, you don't want that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> don't abuse your kids. Cruelty can come in many ways, be it emotional, physical, or spiritual abuse. Don't be cruel to any of these little ones. I promise you that their angels are always with my father in heaven, Matthew 18, 10. Right? And so what's it saying? That listen, especially the godly children, that their children, their angels are watching you. <laughs> you know, you're going to do something stupid. You know, you're going to abuse your kid and take a plate of food away from your children. Yeah. You know, why uh, they are sit there and starving or you're going to do something for yourself and not do it for your kids. Guess what? Uh, yeah. Oh, this one. Right. Yeah. He's a winner. You know, <laughs> you know. You're not doing yourself any favors. You know, we read all those verses. If you're godly, you fear God, you love, and you sacrifice for your children, you're heaping blessings on yourself and your kids. You know, but if you're a cruel and unusual punishment type of person, you know, you're getting it. All right. It's not going to be good. Okay. Let's read the next one that goes with that. Jesus said to his disciples, stumbling blocks are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him to have a millstone tied around his neck and be thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. Luke 17, one through two. Right. That's harsh. I mean, can you imagine Jesus saying that? It's like, okay, I want you to tie your Toyota Supra around your neck and chunk yourself off a cliff. Mm -hmm. If you're, mm -hmm. you're making these kids sin and rebel against me and have pain and hurt in their heart, they can't overcome because of you. Right. I think it's so proper because I think of all those kids that are being sexually abused, right? sold to slavery and who knows, aborted. Right. That stuff. That's, oh yeah. That's, <laughs> to me, abortion it, is just as bad as when they're alive and they're being abused. <laughs> oh, yeah. So Jesus is basically saying, it, you'd be better off to go drown yourself exactly. in the bottom of the ocean. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's what, <laughs> literally what he's saying, listen, guys, it'd be better for you to commit suicide mm -hmm. than to hurt my children. Exactly. That's what he said. Okay. Exactly. Next one. Give good gifts to the children. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Matthew 7, 11. Right? So he's saying, even if you're evil, you know how to do good things for your kids. Give them good things. Give them, you know, we don't want to spoil our kids to the point that they don't appreciate their blessings. But you have other families that go the exact opposite, where they get nothing. I mean, they're treated like cattle or animals, you know? And so you have to provide... Good gifts. So, like, you know, even though, like, financially things are tough and been tough for us, you know, praise God, we're making it. I'm not, not complaining. It's not a complaint. What we have learned, though, is that when the special moments come, you go all out. You just do it and just trust God that he's going to come through on the other end. Like, you know, we all, like, for the kids' birthdays and, and, and holidays and stuff, you know, we spend money we don't have not to go in debt. Not, never, not the debt thing. But, like, make it special. Make them feel important. Make them know that like they're worth something. One of my favorite movies that has a questionable beginning uh, in the bit, uh, front of it is Machine Gun Preacher. Mm -hmm. You know, and in that movie, he was so wrapped up in trying to help these orphan kids that he wouldn't let his children, his daughter, get a, a nice dress and pitch in for the uh, the limo ride to her prom. Mm -hmm. This one event, one time in her life. Come and goes. It's here and it's gone. It's not coming back. You ain't going to have no prom. Right? You're, you're senior. You're done. Right? And so, but he was like so messed up that like he didn't realize. You know, what did Jesus say? It's like the poor you will always have with you. Mm -hmm. Right? Because they come in and anoint his feet. Right? And like the Uber riders, like Judas was like, you should have sold that. We could have helped so-and-so. No, you would have stole it is what he was doing. You know, so what do we learn? That there's, there is a time in your children's life and in your wife's spouse's life that you just have to go, okay, we're doing something nice. Right, because you sacrifice and you're doing the right thing. It's okay to do something nice from time to time. But if, if it's the exception and not the rule, then you're good. You know, you're not like trying to like live the good life and ignore the needs of everyone around you, right? And so we don't ever want to like make our children feel down, lonely. You know, they'll appreciate it. They'll understand the heart of it, right? And what the intent is behind it, okay? So next one. I rejoice greatly that I found some of your children walking truth, even as we have been commanded by the Father. Second John 1, 4. Why is that in there? Because of the truth part, walking in truth. You want to give a good gift to your children, give them the truth. It is the best truth, uh, uh, gift, right? The truth will set you free. That's the gospel. That's the understanding of Jesus. That's the understanding of doing the right thing before the Lord and allowing them to have a path to heaven. 
right? You can't repent for them. You can't make them accept God and Jesus. They have to do that on their own, right? But you can make the path clear. You can be, you know, the trail maker. You can go with your machete and whack down the bushes and cut a path for your children to make it that much easier, right? And so, like, uh, us and our children, what we're trying to do. We're not letting them get infected by the world, right? And but we talk about the world. We don't want them to leave our house in this this whole world of stuff they never experienced or talked about. Right. You know, we talk about it all the time. We don't hide it from our children because this is the world we live in, and we have to inoculate them from it. So it's not like, oh, what is this? Let's go try that. You know, it's like you have to, you know, share in and, and let them know. But the thing is. You provide them that truth, and then when they leave your house, they already understand what's going on. They understand the spiritual dynamic, right? And so that's the best gift you want to add a gift. Okay, top of page five. All right, leave an inheritance. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stirred up for the righteous. Proverbs thirteen twenty two. Now, this inheritance doesn't have to be cash. It could be houses. It could be things. It can be spiritual. I don't have a lot of physical things to leave to my children, but I am leaving a spiritual inheritance for them, right? I'm giving the best gift, right? I wrote my book, uh, We Shall Be Like Him. Get it free at we shall be like <laughs> Okay, plug, it's free. Uh, that was part of my inheritance. When I wrote it, I'm like, listen, what I understand about Christ, God, and Jesus need to be written down so my children and my children's children can read it. Like I've built a path for them that it's literally in a book. I mean, here you go. You know, you want to know God, you want to know Jesus, you want to know the basic Christianity 101, it's in a book, right? And now I, if, when I pass on, Lord willing, that book will just continue on in my family line and be a blessing to those after me, right? And it might have an impact I don't even see yet. I, I, I might not even be around for the impact, which is fine, you know? But, uh, you know, that was part of my inheritance. So you have to be thinking about your children's future, not just physical, money, monetary, but also spiritual, right? And build something for them. Next one. Lo, a third time I am ready to come unto you. I will not be uh, a burden to you. For I seek not yours, but for, uh, but you. For the children ought not for the parents to lay up, but the parents for the children. 2 Corinthians 12, 14, right? And so we should be laying up something, right? Now, again, everybody has different means. Everybody's at a different station of life. But you have something to offer, something to invest into your children's future. Figure out what that is and do it. If it's not money and houses and stuff like that, you can do other things, Right. Figure it out. Pray and ask God, what can I leave for my children? Even if it's your thoughts in a book about life and wisdom and things you've learned. Oh, that's huge. Right. And the mistakes you made and how you, um, anything. I mean, it could be anything. But think about your children's well-being. Okay. Teach your children to obey. You will extend the life of your children by teaching them to obey. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land in which Yahweh your God gives you. Exodus 20, 12, right? So you want your children to be alive? You want them to live? You have to teach them to honor you. Right. If you failed it, <laughs> if you failed to help them understand the necessity to honor mom and dad. Mm -hmm. Listen, all right. Listen, you don't want to be in my house. If any of my children disrespects my wife, mm -hmm. she's my wife and that's their mom. OK, mm -hmm. not pretty. That ain't happening. You got two options, leave or respect. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. It's really boils down to because listen. If they grow up disrespecting you and disrespect, and you let them disrespect your spouse as the wife lets the child disrespect the husband or the husband lets the child disrespect the mom, you're breaking down the, the family dynamic and, and the spiritual pecking order that God has set up, right? And they, they will live in rebellion, which is witchcraft, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to be telling you, don't let that happen. That's bad. I put a note here. Be someone that is easy to honor. Don't be a stumbling block to your children, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, don't be a, a moron. Don't make it hard for them to love you and respect you. Be, make it easy on them. Mm -hmm. Don't be a stumbling block to their growth and to their blessings. So let's read by here. It said, For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a teacher in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know, even the children who should be born, who should arise and tell their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forgot, forget God's deeds but keep his commandments. Psalm 78, 5 through 7. So it's saying there that each generation is supposed to teach the next generation so they can teach the next generation, right? And to, to what? To obey God, to keep his commandments, to fear him, to reverence him, right? You ever like wanted to bless your children? And this has this happened to me. You, ever, you wanted to bless your children, right? But something happened. Like you had something planned. Like this is going to happen. They don't know, 
right? And you are all excited. And then they get disobedient and they get rebellious and you can't give them that gift because you it would reinforce the wrong idea that they could do whatever they wanted and still get all they wanted. Exactly. Right? God is the same way. I'm confident of that. He's out there. He's like, man, I got so much for you. Just do it my way and I will give it all to you, right? And so same with their children, right? We're supposed to teach them these concepts, right? To bless their lives. That's the next one. Then they'll be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their good and the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will not turn away from fo- uh, from following them to do, to do them good. I will put my fear in their hearts and they will not depart from me. Jeremiah 32, 38 through 40. All right. And so God's like, listen, you do these things, guys. I'm going to hunt you down. Right. I will follow you. I'm going to come after you with these blessings. Right. And so, but again, we have to teach them to honor, to obey, to respect, to revere. Right. And if we don't do that, we're robbing them of a blessing from God. Right. Next one. This is the end of the matter. All this has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every hidden thing, whether it is good or or whether it's evil, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14. So what's the whole duty of man? Fear God, keep his commandments. Everything else, that's icing on the cake. What you do in life, what endeavors you have, that's good, secondary. Number one, fear God, keep his commandments. That's your, that's, that's why you're alive. You ever want to know the reason why you're alive? What's your purpose on earth? To fear God and keep his commandments. Now, God has a calling on your life, a spiritual gift blessing, that He, if you do the first one, fear God and keep his commandments, he will let you do the second, right? And you can go into ministry. Right. And so and then he'll bless you in that. And then, you know, it keeps going. It's the blessing train, you know, but it starts with fear God. Keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you want to be my disciples, keep my commandments. You mind my commands, you know. And so it's easy. You can't get away from it. it you know, what do you say? Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who do the will of my father. Right. And so obey. OK, that's your job. That's my job. That's all of our jobs. We're supposed to obey. Let's, let's obey. All right. Next one. Yeah, you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, that you may prolong your days in the land, which Yahweh, your God, gives you forever. Deuteronomy 440. You want to increase your lifespan? Obey God. Mm-hmm. You want to be, you want a short life? Disobey God, right? Because <laughs> God can extend your days. Every day is written in the book. But if you look in scripture, you see times where God extends people's days. It's like, you are written for this. I'll extend it 15 years. So, you know, vice versa. And so you have to remember that, like, listen, honor your mother and father so your life may be long upon the earth, right? So you can shorten your days. What you do determines what you get, right? You don't just get all this because you say, I believe in Jesus. And you, you get all this because you obey Jesus and he's your Lord, okay? Next one. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, 6, right? In other words, you can have a blessing and a teaching upon their heart that they won't be able to shake. And that in their time of crunch in life, and they, they might have rebelled and stuff like that, that they'll remember their training as a child and will be grown up in it, okay? And so you want to set that foundation so when they go out and try to explore life on their own and do some things, you know, they'll have something to come back to, right? And so you can have that confidence that they will come back to it. Next one, teach them these concepts, okay? The children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is righteous. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first command with the promise. Then be well with you and that you may live long upon the land. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, right? So you need to teach them, right? That listen, obeying, and I teach this to my daughter, obeying mom and dad will bless you. You will live longer. God will give you a longer life, right? You want to shorten it? Disrespect us. Easy. Amen. Right. So basically it goes the same way. To obey is better than sacrifice. Right. Towards the Lord and towards your parents. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this pleases the Lord. Colossians 3.20. Right? So obey him all things because it pleases God. Do you want to make God happy? You have to teach your children. That, listen, obeying mommy, da- mom and dad will make God happy. <laughs> you can put a smile on God's face. Okay. Now, top of page six. You are a witness with God how holy, righteously, and blamelessly we behaved ourselves towards you who believe. As you know, we exhorted, comforted, and implored every one of you as a father does his own children to that end that you should walk worthily of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. 1 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, right? So we have to teach them, walk worthy. You're being watched. God is seeing your life. He knows your thoughts. Mm-hmm. So I tell my uh, kids, like, listen, you can lie to me. 
you ain't lying to God. God knows the truth. You know, and our, uh, my daughter, she was like, you know, lying isn't worth it. I was like, why is that? It's like, it takes more effort to try to keep up the lie than it does to tell the truth. <laughs> I was like, yes, it does, honey. You know, it's a burden on your soul. And she gave me an example about one time where she thought, uh, I asked her if she cleaned her room and she said, yes. And then she's like, dad, it's like, I was trying hard. It was so hard to keep the story rolling. You know, and like, so I didn't reveal that I lied to you. It's like, it was more work than it was to clean the room. <laughs> So it's too funny. I was like, yeah, it's not worth it, is it? And he was like, no. So, That's great. Yeah. All right. Discipline your children. Your discipline should be firm, but never greater than your affection, praise, and compliments. Right? A lot of times people that are strong and disciplined, they become weak in the other one. So it burdens the heart of the child. Right? And so however strong your discipline is, it can't be greater than your praise, comfort, and admiration and, you know, uh, you know love, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you always have to keep them in balance. I'm a, I'm a firm discipline person. I am, but my love for my children far outweighs my discipline, you know, cause they have to understand one, like I'm probably one of the only parents that I, I like bless my kids, even though they're disobedient. Cause I never want, uh, my love for them to be connected to their perfection. Amen. You know, so. uh, right. And so they, I don't want to create this false idea that they have to be perfect for dad to love them. Right. And because that's not right with God, that's not right with anything. And so I will still give them blessings and do things for them, even though they have failed in a certain area. Right. Because we have to keep them separate. Now, our relationship will suffer if they don't obey and stuff. And they need to understand it's hurting us. But my love for them is not being challenged by their disobedience. OK. OK. So here's a hit list of some good things that disciplining your children will do. And if you don't do it, then you're, you know, you're sending them to the hot place. OK. You prevent the poverty of your children through discipline. It says, poverty and shame come to him who refuses discipline. But he who heeds correction shall be honored. Proverbs 13, 18. You want your children to be poor, fail to discipline them. Mm -hmm. Right? You don't want, if you want them to be rich and not like filthy rich, but affluent enough to afford life's needs, then you discipline them. It teaches them how to do life. And that's why I teach my children, oh, listen, something greater is going on here than you just doing something wrong and me getting in. I'm trying to help you to become a good human being mm -hmm. and a good adult, right? It's not just like, oh, you did this one thing and dad's freaking out. No, it's like, listen, there's a bigger picture. I'm thinking about 10 years from now, 20 years from now, not just 10 days from now or one day from now. I'm thinking like, how is this going to affect your long-term plan? Exactly. They're only children until they're 18. And right. From then on, yeah, they're on their own. You know, not literally on their own, but yeah, they're adults. Okay, you help save them from death. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Don't be a willing party to his death. Proverbs nineteen eighteen. You want to kill your ch children early? Don't yeah, don't discipline them. You want to prevent death from coming to their doorstep? Discipline them. Mm -hmm. Right? Easy. You will save them from hell. Do not hesitate to discipline a child. If you spank him, he won't die. Spank him yourself, and you will save his soul from hell. <laughs> love how it says, he won't die. Come on. You know, Proverbs 23, 13 through 14, right? You want to change your children from hell? You want to make sure they go to heaven? Out of love, discipline them, right? Now, <laughs> I'll keep going. I was going to say something, but it goes with the next one. You will make them wise. A rod and reproof imparts wisdom, but a child who is understanding brings shame to his mother. Proverbs 29, 15, right? And so in the world, they teach now, you shouldn't spank a kid. You know, wrong. <laughs> Look in the Bible, the one who created children. God says, spank your children, the rod of reproof, the correction, right? And the next one says, spank them yourself. Use your hand, use a belt, whatever you use. You know, that's why they have backsides, right? And so, and you have to do it appropriately. Like, you know, little poor little Jamie's three years old. You walk up to him and just go, stop that, you know? And he's like, instant tears. I, I just like, stop, <laughs> you, know, ah, you know, because he understands what it means, you know? So you don't beat your child and abuse them, which we talked about earlier, you know, but there's a correct godly way to discipline and spank your children, you know, and you need to be doing it. You love them. You want them to be wise, right? Discipline them, period. Okay. You remove foolishness from them. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from them. Proverbs 22, 15, right? And so you want to get rid of that folly in them, that rebellious nature. Mm -hmm. You have to get it early. You can't start disciplining them when they're 15, 16. It's too late at that point. You're fighting an uphill battle, mm -hmm. right? Because 
you know, you're again, like I said earlier, anything you failed to do as a child in the younger years, you're paying for in their teenage years. I promise you that, mm-hmm. you know, and so you didn't, if you failed back then, you're struggling now. Now you still have to discipline them, but it's a uphill battle. Okay. God requires discipline. All right. And uh, next, next one. Correct out of love so your children can be holy like God. But you have forgotten that the scripture says to the God's children, when the Lord punishes you, don't make it light of it. When he corrects you, don't be discouraged. The Lord corrects the people he loves and disciplines those he calls his own, right? So why, do, why are we putting this in there? Because if we love our children, we're going to be like God and do the same thing. Be patient when you are being corrected. This is how God treats his children. Don't all parents correct their children? Uh, God corrects all of his children. And if he doesn't correct you, then you don't really belong to him. So what does that mean? If you're not disciplining your children, are they really your children? That's your job. And if you're ignoring your discipline in your children, spiritually speaking, eh, no, you're failing, right? They're not really your kids because a, a, a real parent will discipline their children because they care about their outcome and their future, right? That's the implication. Next part. Our earthly fathers correct us and we respect them. It, isn't it even better to give true, uh, given true life by letting our spiritual father correct us. Our human fathers correct us for a short time and they do it as they think best. But God corrects us for our own good because he wants us to be holy as he is. Why are we correcting our children? So they can become holy Mm -hmm. like God, like Christ, right? To help them become good human beings, people that are going to be a functioning, effective adults. That'll be a part of society in a positive way and not be a burden upon it to be the light of the world, right? It is never fun to be corrected. In fact, at the time, it is always painful. But if you, if we learn to obey being cor- uh, corrected, we'll do right and live at peace. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a big one, right? Yeah. Now stand up straight. I love this, this part right here. <laughs> now stand up straight. Stop your knees from shaking and walk a straight path. Then lame people will be healed instead of getting worse. Hebrews 12, 5 through 13. You want healing. You want blessing. You want all these things for your children. It's obedience. It's discipline. Okay. Nearing the end here. Guidance for the parents. Primary responsibility. So this first part was all about being a good parent, loving your children, sacrificing the effect you can have on them, even if they're not in your home, your responsibility to discipline them, what the blessings are of discipline upon your children and how you're ensuring a better future for them. Okay. This is for the parents. Okay. Guidance for the parents. Primary responsibility. Spouses and children cannot prevent you from loving, obeying and serving God. All right. It says you cannot be my disciple unless you love me more than you love your father and mother, your wife and your children and your brothers and sisters. You not, can, cannot come with me unless you love me more than you love your own life. You cannot be my disciples unless you carry your own cross and come with me. Luke 14, 26 through 27. Right. Some people idolize and worship their families and their children and their spouses. That's unbiblical. First of all, it puts a burden on them they don't deserve and they can't live up to. Right. And so only God can provide certain things. So what is God? Jesus is not saying don't love your family. No, you, it's replete in scripture. Love your family. Right. What he's saying is that you can't put them up here where God's at. And and say that's a reason why you're not serving God and sacrificing, being obedient to God. Because there will come days where you have to choose pleasing your wife, pleasing your husband, pleasing your children, or pleasing God. And at that point, you're going to go, I'm sorry, guys, I love you, but I have to do what God tells me to do. There's many men that like struggle with this with their own wives that I know, right, that God tells them to do something and they don't do it. Well, the wife doesn't want them to do it. They're just getting flack at home. Well, guess what? This all goes back to the discipline. You're cursing your family by thinking you're saving your family. Mm -hmm. You're putting a burden upon them spiritually because of your own disobedience. Right? So you have to choose Christ. You have to choose God. Mother, father, even for the children, there come a day, you know, where they all have to either decide to please God or please mom and dad. Well, obviously, you're going to have to please God first. Mm -hmm. Right? And then it's your parents. Okay? And same for us. Please God. Then it's your family. Mm -hmm. You know? So the next one. Peter said, look, we have left everything and followed you. He said to them, most certainly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for God's kingdom's sake, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the world to come, eternal life. Luke 18, 28 through 30, right? So when you make that hard choice, when that crunch time hits, it's a tough time. Life's not pretty and roses. You know, a sacrifice is being made. Jesus is saying like, listen, guys, whatever you give up, I will give back. I, you not, You will not outgive me. I am God. I own everything. All the sky, stars in the sky, everything in the entire universe, mine. Right? And so if you think of how small your bank account is and how small your house is compared to the rest of the universe, even just the entire size of the bank and your house, 
and just do a pull-out view. Like, I, I, you're in the sky like Google. You see the United States. You see the Earth. You see the solar system. You keep going back the Milky Way, you know, and the galaxy. Then you see a billion other galaxies. And you just keep going back, right? That's God's, right? That He owns all that, right? And so when Jesus says, listen, guys, if you leave any of this stuff, I got more than you can even imagine. It's not a big thing to go, I'll, I'll repay. Don't worry. Hold your breath. You know, it's coming, you know? And so we have to, as parents, keep that priority right if we want to be effective parents, right? And then our children will understand it, respect it, and it'll be a blessing in their lives because our obedience and faithfulness to God unlocks all those blessings we read, read above on this Bible study, right? All right, next one. Don't chase the American dream slash good life if you want to be a good parent, Right? I love this excuse. It's the, one of the busy, busy, biggest excuses I hear. Well, I got to provide for my family. Well, yeah, you do. But you don't have to provide your family three vacations a year, a brand new car when they turn 16, right? A big house, you know, all the nice gadgets, toys. Nowhere in scripture is that called providing for your family. That's, right. that's affluence. That's fine. But most people think that is, and they'll sacrifice their family to provide for their family. They'll sacrifice for their walk with God to provide for their family. They'll make their kids orphans so they can work long, long hours to give them a vacation. Mm -hmm. So a bunch of people who barely know each other can go spend a week somewhere and act like they're a family. <laughs> you know, and the same thing happens on Christmas. You know, I got you lots of gifts. I don't even know who you are, Dad. Mm -hmm. You know, hold on. I got a call. You know, I got to go check emails. I mean, it's so stupid. God never says to do that. Now, if God uh, blesses you and adds no sorrow to it and you're able to do things, fine. I have no problem with that. Praise mm -hmm. God. You know, I hope he does, you know. But the thing is, that can't be the focus of your life, right? Yes, provide for your family. If you don't, you're worse than a dog. But providing for your family is not making your family filthy, sinking rich, right? Providing for your family is one, spiritual. Then the physical needs to be alive, food, raiment, shelter, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And, and people do it all over the world and they're dirt poor and they're happy, okay? And so don't think you're, you're, the American dream is going to make you happy. But here it says, Jesus said to his disciples, most certainly I say to you, a rich man will enter to the kingdom of heaven with difficulty. I Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into God's kingdom. Matthew 19, 23 through 24. What are you saying there? That the burden of trying to be rich, to maintain your riches, you know, it's, it's, it's such a hard thing, right? And then you worry about it, and it becomes your focus, and you're worried about losing it. And I mean, it's a burden. You ask any rich person, they'll tell you, you know, that like there's so many problems with coming with having that much money. And so don't don't invest into that. If God makes it happen, it's the Bible says God gives the ability to produce wealth. So if it's godly wealth, it'll be a blessing, not a curse. And you can go to sleep at night because you're not putting your hope in it. All right. Yeah. You know, next one. OK. Bottom of page seven. <clears throat> if you see the oppression of the poor and the violent taking away of justice and righteousness in a district, don't marvel at the matter. For one official is eyed by a higher one, and there are officials over them. However, the prophet of the earth is for all. The king profits from the field. He who loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance will with increase. This is all vanity. When goods increase, those who eat them are increased. And what advantage is there to any uh, to its owner? Except, Except uh, to feast on them with his eyes. The sleeping of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats a little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not allow him to sleep. This is, uh, this is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun. Wealth kept by its own owners to his harm. Those riches perish by misfortune. And if he has fathered a son, there is nothing in his hand. As he came out of his mother's womb naked, shall, uh, shall be he go back as he came, and shall take nothing for his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. This is also a grievous evil, that in all points as he has come in, so he shall go. What profit does he, he who labors for the wind? All the, his days he also eats in darkness. He is frustrated and has sickness and wrath. Behold, that which I have seen to be good and prosper is for one to eat and drink and to enjoy good labor and all, uh, good in all of his labor in which he labors under the sun all the days of his life which God has given him, for this is his portion. Every man also to whom God has, has given riches and wealth and has given him power to eat of it and to take his portion to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God, for he shall not, uh, shall not often reflect on these days of his life because God occupies him with the joy of his heart. Ecclesiastes 5, 8 through 20. So what is what's, what is he saying there? Listen, be, be happy with food and raiment. 
then it's all vanity. It's all going to be taken away. You can work your entire life to get a billion dollars and then you're gone. And then who's going to have your billion dollars and what are they going to do with it? Mm-hmm. Right. You, you just don't know. And so what are you saying? There's like, enjoy your food, enjoy your work, enjoy your family, enjoy your wife, enjoy your kids. Cause after that, really there's nothing, mm-hmm. you know, there's different levels of enjoyment. And even if God, he said, if God makes you rich, this is the richest man to ever live, mm-hmm. you know? And he's like, listen guys, it's all pointless. He's like, if another part, he says, I have not restrained anything from my heart, anything I wanted. And he gives this big giant list. You know, I had horses. I had endeavors. I built seasons. I did all these things. It was all pointless. It meant nothing, none of it satisfied. We think that if we can do all these things and have all these things and accomplish all things, we'd be happy. No, because listen, if you're not happy with what you're doing right now and where you're at, you know, as long as you're not being abused or something, you know, then you won't be happy there because guess what? You're going to be there. Right. It's like that people that try to run for the problems. I'm going to move to another state. Well, well, you'll you'll be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you're, the problems will follow you. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I mean, so it's like you have to be content. What did Paul say? Whatever situation I find myself in, I learned to be content, mm-hmm. to abase, to abound, to have and to want, to just be happy in your own skin. And what life is, just try to, you know, it doesn't mean you don't try to increase in endeavors and, and do a project or anything like that. It was just like, listen, but if you're waiting to be happy, at the end of the project, you'll never be happy. Mm-hmm. You'll want another project, right? And so you have to just learn to be content. You know, that life life can always get worse. You don't want to sit there and backhand God and complain about the way your life is. Well, wait until he takes his blessings away from you. How bad is it going to be then? Mm-hmm. You know, like we had a well problem for seven days. We we're still praising God for our well. Like, thank God that we have some drink of water coming out of our faucet. Right. You know, I mean, you don't sit there and get down in the mouth about stuff. Because, listen, God is blessing you in ways you don't understand. Mm-hmm. You know, and we praise God that it lasted so long. You know, it, with no problems for basically uh, the entire time we've been there. Ten years besides when we, they first put it in, the pipe broke because they used the wrong pipe. But they fixed it for free. And so, you know, so it's basically been hassle-free for a decade. How, how can anybody get down in the mouth about that and go, whoa, it's me. I'm like, man, 10 years. Woo, praise God. You know, I mean, it's amazing it lasted that long. And it's still lasting, you know, outside of that one part. So thank you, Jesus. All right. Yeah. Top of page eight. <laughs> As we hit the end here. All right. It says, this is not to say you're not supposed to provide. It says, if anyone doesn't take care of his own relatives, especially his immediate family, he has denied the fa- uh, Christian faith and worse than an unbeliever. First, team, uh, First Timothy 5 eight. Why is that in there? Because some people are like, oh, Lance, the American dream, you're saying you should provide. No, you should provide, but keep it in check. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, you know, you know people that are perpetually in, in college to get degrees so they can provide a better life for their family. Mm-hmm. Well, they're doing school every night. They do overtime at work. They never spend time with their family. So they'll spend 18 years of their children's life providing that better life that never comes. They might have a nicer retirement, but the years that really matter are gone. Right? Don't do that. That's dumb. Right? And so I've seen uh, and heard of people that what they do is when their children are in the house, they focus on that. But when the children grow up and leave, then they focus on their careers. That's beautiful. Do that. That's a wonderful plan. You know, and so, and then go to college and then do what you want to do. You still can meet your dreams and do the things you want to do. God's not saying don't have dreams, right? Mm-hmm. He said, just put it in the right order. He will always provide if you stay within his boundaries. Right, right. And it might not be in your schedule or your mm-hmm. timing, exactly. you know, but God's going to meet it, yeah. you know? And so if you just learn to be content, right, it'll make you a better parent, right? You won't always want more, strive for more, demand more, seek for more, right? It's that always like, I want this. I deserve that. Why aren't they doing this? They need to come here and do that, you know? And you're putting all this burden on everybody else to bring you happiness Mm -hmm. and to find contentment. Well, there's some happiness that people can't provide you. You have to find it in Christ Jesus. You have to find it in the Lord. He has to be the one that provides that. Now, yes, there's things that like, for example, my wife, I require my wife and she requires me. That's fair, right? But if that's the sole focus and the reason for my happiness of my day, uh, uh-uh, that's an unhealthy burden upon my wife, right? And same for my kids. People do it to their kids. Well, I want my kids this and I want my kids that. And, and, and then they, they try to dominate their lives. Like my kid's going to be a superstar in this sport. And, mm-hmm. you know, they try to live vicariously through their children. Unfair. That's unfair. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so as Christians, yeah. our hope and our foundation is in Christ and loving God and let him fulfill those deep inner longings that we need, right? That we can't put upon our spouses. We can't put upon our children. God has to be the one to provide for that. And if we allow for that, then God will allow our our spouses and our children to provide as they're supposed to, Mm -hmm. right? They're the icing. They're not the cake, 
right? And so we can't put that burden in and get that mixed up, okay? Next one. If you want to serve God, right? This is a faithful saying. Someone who seeks to be an overseer desires a good work. The overseer, therefore, must be without reproach. The husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, modest, hospitable, good at teaching. Not a drinker, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. One who rules his own house well. Man, we should just stop there. How many people are trying to do ministry who can't even get their own house in order? Right, their own house is falling apart, and they turn and they think they're going to go be useful for God. And as I say, if God provides you an opportunity, you're not supposed to speak up and give a reason for your faith and encourage a brother. But like, if you're really doing ministry, if you really want to do something for Christ, focus on your house first. Right, that's your primary ministry. Right, and again, I said last week, I said this week, if my house suffers, this is done. I'm done with this. I have to focus on my house, Mm -hmm. and then once I get that back in order, I can go back to this. Right, but I always have to remember they come first. They're my first ministry. Right, if I'm spending a lot of time with people and their problems, but I don't have time a day for my wife and hers. (laughs) What? What a horrible husband. Mm -hmm. I mean. Smack, smack me someone. Okay. Right. And Angel's like, okay. You know, same thing with my kids. If I could sit to talk to somebody for two or three hours on the phone, but I can't talk to my daughter in the same manner, in the same way, and give her the same affection. Horrible Lance. Horrible Lance. Bad Lance. Bad Lance. You all right? And so a lot of people do this. Right. And that's why you see a lot of ministers with divorces and their children are unruly. Even the Bible says if you can't, if your children are unruly, you can't be a minister to Christ in the, in the church. You can donate time and stuff, but you can't be a leader. Right. Because if you can't lead your home, what are you doing? How do you think you're going to help lead other people? Right. And you don't, don't. And a lot of people are like, well, it's just my family. They're unruly. No, it takes some responsibility, man. You know. All right. Next part. Having children in subjection with all reverence. That's the key. So you rule your house. Your children revere and, and obey. But how could someone who doesn't know how to rule his own house take care of God's assembly? Right. I mean, come on. That's common sense. But people do it all the time. Not a new convert, lest being puffed up and he fall into some condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have good testimony for those who are outside to avoid falling into reproach in the snare of the devil. First Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Okay. You, we want to serve God. We want to do ministry. Focus at home. That's your first primary ministry is your house, your children, your wife. You know that if you, if you can't get them there. Right. What are you doing? That doesn't mean that they're always going to be perfect and the situation is always going to be perfect. That means that you got that base covered. Then you can branch out from there. Okay. Let be let servants be husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house well. For those who have served well will gain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith in which is in Christ Jesus. First Timothy 3, 12 through 13. So like if you guys, if I'm ministering to you guys and I'm telling them like, well, this helps marriage, this helps your kids. And then you come to my house and my house is in a complete junk mess, disarray. Everybody's disrespecting everybody. Kids are disobedience. That just cuts my testimony all to shreds. Everything I said was useless and wasted, right? And so that's why, you know, me and Angel talked about the TV uh, before that, like people on TV, you don't know their lifestyle. You don't know their house. You don't know their children. You don't know, but you see the effects of their divorces and their children rebelling in the faith, you know? So what does that say? Stop listening to them. Mm-hmm. That means stop listening. You're wasting your time. These people haven't got it right in their own lives. Right. You know, the, er, break, time to hit the brakes. If I know of a minister and he's getting a divorce, break time. You know, it doesn't mean you can't love him, be nice and kind and stuff, but don't teach me anything. Exactly. You know, unless you want to teach me your folly and let me know how you messed up, then I'll listen to that. You know, because obviously you failed. Angels laughing. But uh, you know, true story. And same for me, guys. If you see me stumble and fall and I start having horrible problems, tell Lance to shut up. Mm-hmm. Right? Tell him to stop wasting his time. I might have good something to say, but listen, I need to get my house in order. Okay, and that's biblical. That's the truth. Okay, Um, next one. I left you in Crete for this reason, that you would set in order the things that were lacking in appointing elders in every city. As I directed you, if anyone is blameless, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, who are not accused of loose or unruly behavior, for the overseer must be blameless as good steward, not self-pleasing, not easily angered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for dishonest gain, but given to hospitality, a lover of good, sober-minded, fair, holy, self-controlled, holding to the faith. Full word, which is according to the teachings, that he may be able to exhort in sound doctrine 
and to convict those who contradict yeah. him. Titus 1, 5 through 9, right? That last part. So he may convict those who contradict him. So if I'm sitting here like, guys, this is good for marriage. This is how you should be. You should be outwardly focused, not inwardly focused, right? But you come to my house and you find out it's different, right? Right. Then I'm contradicting my own testimony. You could be like, Lance, you're a moron. What are you doing? You're not doing what you tell us to do. Uh, how's that work? You know, it doesn't work. It's it's pointless. So as as family members, as parents, if we want to serve God, service begins in the home. You're the head, high priest of, of your house. And, you know, same for moms. You want to be in ministry? Make sure your kids are doing right. Be a godly example. Right. And then you can branch out. And I've known some people, I think I've told you this before, where this lady wanted to go do ministry and to help these kids, you know, and do coloring and all this other stuff. You know what her kids said to this? He's like, you're doing it with those kids. You've never done it with us. Sad. It's insane, so sad. right? And so we don't want to do that to our own family, to our own children. So, again, you want to serve God? Starts at home, right? You want to lead people? Lead your family, right? You want to be a blessing to the body of Christ? Be a blessing to your family. Right. And then branch out, you know, and so and then it'll work out and then your family will do it with you. Right. And they'll they'll be your backbone and not your burden. Right. And they'll help you in it. OK. And here we are at the end. OK. Only two things can be taken to heaven. For as the new heavens, new earth, which uh, uh, which I will make shall remain before me, says Yahweh. So your offspring and your name shall remain. Isaiah 66, 22. So your children and yourself. Right. Those are the two things that get to go to heaven. Now, uh, Solomon gave us this whole list. It's vanity, vanity. It's all going to perish. Everything you invest your life into is junk. My, one of my friends was like, well, that's depressing. I was like, well, it takes the pressure off, actually, to know that the world pressure is a lie. Your goal is to get your family to heaven. You know, and if that's radical, if that seems insane to the world, that's fine. It's the world. What do they know? They don't know anything, right? They're, they're, they're ignorant in the things of God, right? And But us, we can go like, wife, husband, Children, those can go to heaven. Family members, they can go, right? So if you want to bring something with you into heaven, that'll be a testimony to your righteousness and your faithfulness and the, how you lived your life. Bring your family, right? Bring your family, bring your children, right? That'll be something that'll last forever, right? And so other than that, you know, it's, it's fun. It's nice to have nice things. Don't get me wrong. I like nice things too, right? But I, it's down here on my list, right? God, Christ, Jesus, family, nice things. Right. Because I can be happy without not without nice things. I cannot be happy without God's presence in my life. Right. It, it eats me. I hate it. You know, so if I displease him and upset him, uh, -uh I don't want it. I have such like a, a strong personal conviction that like it's like someone threw hot water on my face and then pummeled me to death and then drove over me with a car and then threw me off a bridge. That's how it feels. So it's like it won't let go, you know, <laughs> so. You know, and Boy. yeah, exactly. And you feel it, it aches and it hurts, you know, and you don't want that. So here at the bottom, at the very bottom of page eight, it says, so as we have learned, there's a lot you can do to support and encourage the physical, emotional and spiritual being of your kids, even if they do not live with you. Every parent has a powerful role to play in the success of their children here or far. There you go. Praise God. So I hope that encourages everyone. If your kids aren't even with you and they live outside the house or they do live with you, split, broken home, 50-50 homes, you know, you get them sometime, they get sometime. It doesn't matter. You live your right life righteously before Christ. You are blessing your children. Mm -hmm. Even if you never see them ever, you're blessing your kid. Mm -hmm. You want to do something for your kid? Put God first. Live righteously. Your blessing is upon them because of that. God is dealing with them in a faithful, loving way because of you. Okay, and don't forget that ever. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you give us this opportunity as parents to continue to bless our children in millions and millions of different ways. One of which is to love you, to, to keep you supreme, to obey you, to fear you, to speak their ble your blessings over their lives, Father. So we thank you for this. Bless all the parents out there that are separated uh, from their children, you know, or parents that have children at home and it's a split home and belief wise. And so we ask you to just be with them, encourage them, empower them to just go hard for you, hard for heaven, and just go all in. If they can, they can do this for their children, Father, their, their obedience and commitment to you will bless their babies. And so we praise you and we thank you so much for the children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. That was an awesome message. Praise God. If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page 
for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. BrotherLamps.com